time to join us today. This is our uh, 17th customer webinar. And the subject today is industrial flame monitoring for continuous burners and difficult applications. Today's presenter is Lalit Mita. Lalit is a senior application engineer and sales engineering manager with Honeywell. He received a degree in electrical engineering from University College in London. Um, Lalit has been in the industrial burner, boiler management, and flame safety monitoring field for over 30 years. So if you have an application question, please ask Lalit before we're done this morning. I will be muting the phone line, so if you have a question and would like to unmute yourself, all you have to do is hit star 6 and you will be unmuted. At the end, uh, we will unmute everyone, so if you want to save your questions, feel free to ask at the end. So at, at this point in time, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Leilit. Uh, thank you, Bob, uh, and good morning to all of you, and uh, make sure that all of you can hear me okay. Um, I just need your yes, you know. <laughs> um, yes, that's fine. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, if you feel that uh, something that doesn't make sense or I wasn't able to explain to you very well, um, I know Bob said wait until the end of the uh, you know presentations, but you know you're welcome to interrupt me if you want, uh, and I'll try to explain it in a either different way or maybe try the same way but a little bit uh, different approach. Basically, um, I have been working on a flame safeguards or flame safeties or flame monitoring system for many, many years. Um, my, my first work was with FireEye, and then uh, I worked for Honeywell. This is going back to 70s, and then Peabody and Cohen, and now Iris, and then Iris was recently acquired uh, end of July by Honeywell. So now... Uh, it has taken a full circle for me from Honeywell back to Honeywell after almost 30 years. You know, so uh, any questions you have, even if it is not a Honeywell product or Iris product or you know the other company that I work for, I have a lot of uh, information gathered about you know uh, the flame safeguard from manufacturer that we normally don't see in USA, like uh, people like BFI, Durag, and some others. I have also done a lot of startups and uh, work on a power plant so, uh, and burner management systems. And I'm a, I'm a current uh, member of uh, NFPA 85 uh, multi-burner technical committee. So if you have any questions or interpretation of NFPA or the reason for thinking particular way by NFPA committee, feel free to call me or you can... Uh, you know, um, uh, Bob will be able to give you all my uh, informations how to contact me. I'll be very happy to help you out and give you the interpretation of uh, NFPA as I see it. You know, I cannot give you the committee's formal response, but I can say this was the intentions behind writing something that may sound very strange. So let's start, and I'm going to start with the first uh, slide now. You should be able to see this, and if uh, everybody can see that, that'll be great. Uh, so what we're going to talk about is flame uh, monitor's history of development, and we're not going to dwell too much on it, uh, but we are going to go on to the principle of flame detections, what is currently used, and what is the possibility of the new concept that might come up. And I... After that, I will explain to you why IRIS equipment is unique in many ways and has been able to address uh, applications that has, you know, uh, been very difficult for major manufacturers of flame safeties. And we can have a questions and answer at the end, but if you feel that you need to ask something in, in the middle of presentations, please don't hesitate. So the history of scanning development we should start with uh, what happened prior to the uh, Second World War. So prior to 1950, and actually we can go a little bit back further and look at thermocouples and equipment of that nature, but I kind of skipped that because I think everybody knows about that. 
So around 1950, we used flame ionization. And this concept is even years used today, which is what, like 60 years after. And the uh, only thing we have done in, in that uh, area is to develop a better electronics, but the main concept still remains the same. In 1950, UV tube was invented, and primarily these were two companies, Honeywell and FireEye, or ETA, developed this tube. And that is still used in uh, both, both by Honeywell and FireEye, but there is a basic difference basic difference between uh, the tube used by Iris versus all the other people uh, and I and we'll go a little bit detail into that. In 1962 uh, the late sulfide solid state uh, device was uh, uh, invented and it, that is still used today but gradually that has been replaced with a uh, different kind of uh, sensor that have a different doping to create a uh, uh, response in a much closer to the UV area. And in 1976, uh, the principle of flame flicker system or flame flicker was discovered by or used actually, it was discovered a long time ago, but it was really used as a practical instrument by Bailey Meter Company. And, but keeping in mind that in 76, we did not have a very powerful microcomputers. In fact, I don't think there were any microcomputers yet. So a lot of things were not done the way it is done today with a, uh, different ways of signal analyzing. So let's look at uh, the response curve of the different sensors and different fuels. So on the left-hand side where my cursor is now, this is a typical response of a, a UV tube and you can see that the UV tube has got a very high response around 200 nanometers. And if you follow a little bit further, uh, the new sensors now that are being manufactured, they respond in what they call a near UV region. Uh, don't, don't get hanged up by how they respond, but it's uh, important to know that uh, quite often the buzzwords are used, you know. So anyway, that's the UV, UV or near UV region. Then if we go further down, uh, there is a solid state sensor that responds in a uh, visible light area. And then finally, you know, anything above uh, uh, 1,100 or 1,000, you know, becomes an IR region. And if you look at the uh, response of each fuel, um, those who are interested in coal will see that coal has got a pretty good output at a or near the UV tube area, but there is another reason why UV tube based scanner uh, have a difficult time monitoring coal flame. Uh, you got a, uh, oil, you got a gas, and all of these are responding in a UV region. You can see that as we go further out, that we have to do something about the response from the refractory. And that becomes a challenge uh, because if you look at the output from the refractory, the hot refractory is quite considerable uh, compared to uh, oil, uh, uh, coal, and uh, gas. Now, also, I would like you to notice one thing that if you look at uh, the response of the sunlight to the UV tube based scanners, you'll see it falls short of uh, about 280 nanometers. And we took the advantage of this one by creating or by making the, the what we call a watchdog 3, which is flare monitoring system. And that flare monitoring system is uh, totally immune to sun rays. We could not do that with other sensors, because if you are using an IR sensor, you can see the sunlight has a tremendous amount of output in that area. So those uh, sensors working on a uh, infrared range has to have a, some additional circuit or something has to be given to make sure that you are not looking at sunlight in a, in a flare monitoring system. So let me go to the next one. Uh, the One of the reasons why IRIS has been very successful is that we eliminated uh, 
mechanically based shutter system from UV tube based scanner. This has been a challenge for all the manufacturers. And the and couple, next slide will explain to you a little bit more how we have been able to do that. Basically, Iris uh, uses a UV tube that is called UV Tron. This is a manufacturer's uh, designation as a UV Tron. And in this tube, anode remains anode and cathode remains cathode. In other words, we are not changing the two electrodes inside the UV tube or the function of two electrodes. A pulse generated uh, when the power is applied and uh, when the UV source is present is gathered and then manipulated, uh, you know, diagnosed and then we say, okay, now we have a, a UV. Right, right. Uh, so we are using a different type of tube uh, compared to what Pyra and Honeywell and other people use with the mechanical shutters. And I think the next slide will be able to help you understand the basic way how the two tubes are used. In fact, the structure of both tubes are very different. Uh, although basically you can, may say that they are just glass filled envelope with uh, some inert gas, but the way the technology works is a little bit different. And so we are using, uh, instead of using an analog signal from the tube, we are using a pulses, you know, and we count those pulses and from that we can tell uh, whether the flame is on or not by setting up certain thresholds. Now, going, let, I'm going to go to the next uh, uh, thing. Let me see. Yep, and and go to the next one, and I'll show you. So on the left hand side here, under the mechanical shutter assembly based system, you'll notice that most of the UV tube based scanners. In fact, I think all of them are required. requires an AC input and when the UV, when it reaches certain voltage and you have a, a UV present, the tube fires. Uh, this is where the tube is firing, okay? And if we take those signals and manipulate them, uh, you know, in other words, straighten them out or, you know, put a DC coupler, whatever it is, then we get a, a signal that looks like that. At this point, uh, a check cycle is performed by cutting off the UV uh, line of sight or, you know, sh mechanical shutter comes in and then it recovers and it goes back. One of the problem with this kind of uh, system is that if in the plant you are performing a piping check using X-rays or gamma rays radiations, then during this check cycle, if you have a, uh, you know, X-rays being done close by, and when we say close by, it could be as far as 50 feet away, and then the signal is breached here, or bridged, and this, uh, as far as the system is concerned, it thinks that the UV tube has failed, because it, it sh it's looking for no signal during this check cycle, and now the signal comes from the radiation. So what will happen is it will trip. Uh, this was a big problem with the many, many scanners and eventually uh, people learn, you know, how to live with it by just bypassing it during the X-rays and gamma rays. So we talk about a little bit about uh, iris scanners and in here what we do the same thing but instead of putting an AC voltage as shown here, we are going to put a DC voltage and by varying or changing the level of DC voltage, we, we get our gain control. Here, you know, you're going to have these small signals that are amplified. So signal-to-noise ratio here is very low. You've got a small signal, a lot of noise. So both of them, if you amplify, the noise becomes too high. And if it goes above the trip level, then you get a false flame. But here, we're going to be using the pulses. So we put a DC voltage, our anode and cathode remain same. Compare here again, anode and cathode keeps on changing its polarity as you put a sine wave. Some of you who have used the UV based scanner will probably remember also that when you buy it, you have to specify whether it's 50 hertz or 60 hertz, and there are two different models. Whereas in our systems, you know, we don't really have any uh, pol uh, 
issue with the polarity, I mean the, the frequencies, because we're going to take AC, even if we have an AC input to the system, we convert it into DC and use that DC as a controlling voltage. So anyway, in a given time, we start counting how many pulses we are getting, and if those pulses count is above certain value, then we say you got a go signal. If the count fails, then we know, uh, or is below certain value, then we say it is not a usable signal. Now, I didn't come out very well, but if you can see on the side here, there's a little arrow. So in our system, in ID systems, when you are doing X-raying and a gamma rays when the system is on, it actually adds a little bit of a signal to the signal that is generated by the UV tube. So it doesn't, it does get affected, but it's not adversely affected. All you will see is that some count goes up and you get a little bit better or higher signal than uh, that you got before the X-rays or gamma rays was performed. However, if the tube does fail, and this is the part I would like to you to look at it, then it internally generates uh, signals that are all equally spaced and of the same amplitude. And when that happens, the logic or the electronics in the system will say, I expect all the flame, real flame signals to be very dynamic, both in, in time as well as in amplitude. If I get this constant signal, that means the tube is no good now, and therefore it should be, you know, the unit has to be replaced. But we do this thing without a mechanical shutter. And that has been a great advantage of, uh, uh, ID system. So we are probably the only people now who extensively use uh, UV tube for gas firing. And like we pointed out earlier, its response in a UV region is so high that you don't need to amplify much more than what you get from the raw, uh, uh, the raw signal you get from the UV tube. So let me go to the next slide. So summary of a UV tube, it responds is between 180 and 12. 280 nanometer. OK. Go ahead. Uh, so, so the UV tube has got some great advantages. It provides you with a basic high amplification straight from the tube itself, very high signal to noise ratio. In fact, the noise is almost zero in, uh, in the UV tube. Uh, it's a very good discriminator. Uh, in, in the sense that it will not see anything from the re refractory or, you know, anything that is responding in visible light or infrared. Excellent for gas flames. It comes with some disadvantages. Uh, potential to fail in on conditions. This is often referred in the industry as a runaway tube. And we have addressed that, that we can capture that without using a mechanical shutters. Uh, expensive compared to flame road or solid state, you know, the, the solid state devices are getting cheaper and cheaper. So comparatively, UV tubes are expensive. One other thing that uh, makes it, uh, uh, one has to be careful where you're using, they're a little bit more susceptible to vibration, just like a bulb or lamp. So you have to be careful that, uh, you know, if there's a vibration is very excessive, you need to do something to make sure that the tube doesn't uh, prematurely fail. Uh, the other thing that makes it impossible to use in many applications is uh, reduction in signal due to recirculating gases at the burner tip. And if, as you go further away from the source of flame, the signal falls at a, uh, this uh, 1 over d squared. So the longer the distance, your signals coming back to the UV tube gets uh, attenuated or lost. So again, just in a summary, Iris uh, uses UV tron, no response to sunlight, and uses the digital processing technology, pulse count versus analog signals from other systems. And in our all our flame safety, Iris flame safety, there are no mechanical shutters and it doesn't get a negative effect from X-rays or gamma rays. So what is the flicker frequency? Now, currently, you'll find that almost all the vendors of flame safety will be using this principle for all the fuels, gas, oil, and coal. And so we need to understand what is flicker frequency and how do we 
utilize this principle to monitor the uh, flame for different fuels. So I have a picture here showing you that in typically uh, the get, uh, oil and coal comes out from a single nozzle uh, and you will see the flame has got a pretty pronounced distribution as shown here and this is really very much like the flame. Only difference is that in a case of flame uh, this thing will be going up because of the heat rising above but otherwise they are very identical. So the fastest movement of the water or in the case of our flame is right here at the root of the flame. So IR or I'm sorry the flicker based scanners works very well when you have a very fast moving flame. On the other hand if you look at the gas we have a multiple nozzles much lower pressure than oil and even with a pulverized coal you know you have a uh, uh, coal particulates or uh, pulverized coal coming out at much higher velocity through the primary air. So now we have a multiple nozzle, low pressure, so our movement, comparative movement in this area where the, the fuel comes out to oil and coal is much, much slower. So the discrimination becomes a real issue with a flicker-based scanner for a slow moving flame. So this becomes a challenge with gas because the gas is a very slow moving flame compared to oil and coal. So if somebody asks me, I would say if you have oil and coal, use any flicker based scanner. They will work pretty well. After that, it's really bells and whistles on each product that you might be interested in. But basically, all the scanners will work well. But when it comes to gas, uh, flicker based scanners has a tremendous problem on many applications where the gas flames are very small. Now you have to also think of it that in many burners, the igniters are pretty small. So if you have a one scanner trying to see the igniter gas flame, and let's say this is igniter gas plus coal oil, then you might be all right with oil, but at, uh, the igniter gas will have a, such a low moving flame that you will have a very difficult time uh, getting the setup done. And we are talking about multi-burners now where you will be able to get a good signal from the pilot and the main gas if you have one and at the same time get a discrimination you need from other burners. So let's go to the next one. So here is a uh, two burners. You can think of these two burners one over one or side by side or really doesn't uh, make much difference. We are looking at this area where the uh, flame flicker or the flame movement is the highest. Then we go further down here and we get a uh, lower flicker frequencies and then we get a larger envelope here. Uh, this doesn't show you that way but this is the largest envelope compared to the source and this is where the flicker frequency is even the lowest. So taking this example, uh, the way we make it work is that we have a either a high pass or a band pass filter and the scanner looks at the flame through here and we set it up that above certain frequency will accept the signal and when this flame goes out the scanner will be looking at a much lower frequencies and that frequency will be rejected. So that's how the flicker based scanner works. But you can see now from this picture that if this one is also a lower or a slower moving uh, flame and it then it becomes a challenge to discriminate that against also another slower moving flame. So the flicker based scanner has that big disadvantage. It is looking for uh, how fast the flames are moving and if the flames are not moving very fast, uh, you will have a very difficult time controlling that. So here is a, how we, we can uh, look at the flicker from the flame uh, by uh, the French guy by the name of Fourier he came up with a mathematical for formula to convert any movement into two segments, the amplitude or a strength and associated uh, flicker or frequency. So here is the background. Okay, We're going to be looking at a multi-burner uh, systems where we know that uh, on this particular application the, the amplitude, okay, 
So you need two components. You need some signal and some flicker. Okay. So at this point here, our amplitude is zero. <laughs> okay, I'll just speak louder, you know, so you can hear it. So this is our flame signal now, and those flame signals, we, we know that now it terminates around 70 hertz. So if I, I combine these two signals to show you what it looks like now, and <clears throat> if we can select a filter point at this point here, we will get some contribution from the background, but you know our signal is pretty good here, so signal to noise ratio will be pretty high, so we should be able to distinguish between the target burner flame and the background flame. And that is how the most flicker-based scanner works. They work on a high-pass filter. There are a couple of manufacturers who make a band-pass filter, and basically all it means is that the, the response is like that, whereas here everything beyond this point is accepted as a good signal. Anything below that, or you know, lower than 33 hertz or whatever we decide, is rejected. So here is another example of it. So now we have selected this filter point. All the signals here are rejected. All the signals on this side are accepted. And we will then be able to say there is a flame or there is no flame. And in our case, the filters are settable from 16 hertz, 24, and so on, up to 215 hertz. After the 200 hertz, really not many flame will produce that high of a frequency. There are some, but very, very few of them, and really it's not necessary to go any more than that. So let's go to the next slide. Now, you know, in the previous slide, we showed you that, okay, you got a good signal, and you got some background here. So what I want to do, I want to reject this background, uh, and I can do that if I have an adjustable threshold. An adjustable threshold, all it means that I will make sure that any signal above that is acceptable, any signal below that is rejected. So now, even at this set point, I get some contribution from the background, but I can reject that by simply setting up this threshold that is above that uh, uh, background noise or the background flames. So that's the way, basic way how the flicker-based system works. Now, flicker-based system has got some great advantages. It's very inexpensive sensor. We don't have to worry about the sensor's failure mode. It will always fail safe. In other words, either open or just won't work. You know, it doesn't generate its own frequencies. Excellent for fast-moving flames such as oil and coal flames, and does not get affected by X-rays or gamma rays. So those are the great advantages of it. The biggest disadvantage is when you have a small gas burner where the flames are moving very slow, uh, signal to noise ratio is very high. So it becomes useless uh, to try to discriminate against the background. And it has got a slightly low ambient temperature rating compared to UV drone uh, or the UV tube based scanner and difficult to discriminate or even monitor slow moving gas flames. Now this is the, when we look at this uh, part of it, you have to keep in mind that in many cases, we have to be able to see the pilot also. And in this country now, in USA, we are now most power plants that used to have a oil as a uh, startup burner or igniter and a start, uh, small load carrying burners or partial load carrying burners. Uh, has now been replaced gradually with uh, gas. So we need a scanner that should be able to take the advantage of both uh, flicker-based system for oil and coal and a UV tube-based scanner that will also be able to monitor the gas flames. So we, we have a combination that we will discuss in a few minutes. To help us further discriminate between the flames that we want to see and the flames we don't want to see, uh, all iris equipment has what we call an adjustable threshold. So you can adjust the flame off trigger point, and you can adjust the flame on trigger point. And you know this, these are all set on each of our equipment by simply selecting the numbers. 
you know, so it's a very repeatable. You can always get back and say, okay, my count was 1,500, and you set it up 1,500 and 1,250. And the way this works is that when you first, if the burner is off and the signal from the background reaches all the way up to here, the flame relay will not be energized. It will still remain de-energized until the flame count increases above your flame on trigger point. So, uh, you know, in this particular case, for example, it has to be above 1500 before the flame relay will be energized. Once it is energized, it can go up and down. In fact, it can come down all the way up to here, let's say 1300, and the flame uh, relay will still remain energized. So this is a trigger point where the flame relay gets energized. So you can have a background signal and in some cross-fired burners or post-fired burners, it is impossible to get 100% uh, discrimination so that the background is always zero. There's just no way you're going to be able to do that. So we can tolerate some signals from the background as long as we set it up so that it will not trigger the flame on conditions. Now, once we get the flame on, it will stay in that respect all the time uh, for, you know, until the burner is turned off. Now, let's say that something happens and the signal goes down below the flame of trigger point. When that happens, our system will start counting the flame failure response time that you have or the user has selected. If you recover before that flame failure response time has expired, then you'll come back and the system will be totally transparent to the user. I, you know, you wouldn't even know that it dipped down that way and then came back, you know, unless you are charting it. However, if the signal remains below that point, then you're going to have a, a flame off point and the flame relay will be de-energized. So the response time is selectable from one to three seconds. And we can't go more than three seconds because uh, there is an inheritance time delay built into the electronics, which is about 200 milliseconds. So total time when you select three seconds is 3.2, which is within the uh, requirements of the most scores, which says less than four seconds for FFRT or flame failure response time. So these points are user adjustable, and you know you can adjust it this one to all the way down to say 100 and make flame on to 300. It just depends upon the applications you have, and the the beauty of this system is that because it's a digital base. Everything is based on the numbers, so you can repeat it. In fact, you can set up this unit, all of our fence scan processors, on the bench and then just replace it in the field without having to adjust it again, as long as you have a data of what you set it up before. So let me go through uh, how, how it is, uh, why it is uh, that Iris product is so different. Well, there were three areas where we concentrated. One was how to make the adjustment easy for uh, users. So every, all our processors have a built-in uh, push buttons, displays, uh, 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 meters, everything else so that you, it's easy for you to repeat whatever the setups are. And uh, all of the menus are very easy to understand and, you know, basically in English language. So you don't have to work out you know what this means like numbers or some short form so what are the things that we need to adjust we have to adjust the gain uh, filter in case of uh, flicker based scanners flame on and flame off those are the first four that you must uh, uh, adjust them for each individual applications in many cases the default value from the factory might even work so you know, you just have to start from some point, and I would recommend that you start from the default point and then make the adjustment as necessary. The other two items you need to adjust is a flame failure response time, which we just discussed, and a flame yeah, on delay. So the flame on delay works on a, you may require this where you have a, a burners that are located above the grate and you are firing something on the grate that temporarily brings the flame into line of sight. Uh, this would be typically for the back fired boilers or, uh, uh, you know, fluidized bed boilers where we have a coal firing and then you have a perhaps a startup burner on the top. 
or anywhere where you have a flame creeping into your target zone, but you don't want to recognize it, then you put a flame on delay. And that goes up to four seconds. One caution, though, uh, when you use this, you have to be careful that you are cutting into the ignition timing. So if your ignition is set for 10 seconds trial, and the flame comes, and you set flame on delay for four seconds, and the flame comes on at uh, seven seconds, it simply will run out of the time and will not recognize. So just be careful when you use the flame on delay. Uh, some models can indicate viewing head internal temperature. So now you don't have to go there with the burner front and find out, you know, especially with a large utility boilers where the burners are located on multi-levels, you can check the viewing head temperature simply by pushing a couple of buttons on the, uh, on the uh, processor. And we have an optional uh, software that is uh, Flame Tools using modified MOS board mode bus allows multiplexing to a single PC. So you can now have a multiple loops connected, daisy connected or daisy chain connected, and then you use a, a converter from RS-422 or RS-485 to RS-232 and bring it to a single PC for remote monitoring and control. So summarizing the method that is used now is rectifications, which is still used and, uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot of places where I, it, you'll see that. Uh, all our IE scanners are based on a UV tube, but is using a bipolar UV front tube. This would be great for gases and light oil. Uh, solid state sensor, fast Fourier transform, and it's good for some gas, oil, and coal, or and coal. But you have to be careful that the gas flame has to be fast moving. And then we have a combination UV and IR. And in our case, the UV and IR is both working in parallel. So whichever signal is the highest is taken as a good signal. In addition to above, where you will need a combination UV IR is a sulfur recovery unit, kiln, and places where other than uh, clean gases are used. So any gas that has got a contaminations in it that will sparkle or move very slow, we can use both uh, UV and IR. So here is some of our product. This is the most mature product that we have. Uh, there's uh, thousands of these units in operation for many years. And it is the most, I would say, easiest one to um, set it up. It can support two viewing head, but this two viewing head has to be switched from A to B. So you can, you can only have physically one connected to the unit or, you know, electrically one connected to the unit, uh, uh, and one is like a standby. So I, I think if you have to use the two switch un, uh, heads, there is a better product that we'll discuss it in a minute. Now, P532, I'm skipping this for a minute, but P532, is a specifically designed, was actually specifically designed for tangentially fired boiler where you may need the uh, three scanners. And two of them may be the main fuel, so they'll be located in the nozzles, you know, tilting nozzles. And the third one, which is a 700 system for the horn igniters or the side fired igniters. Now, if you have a lot of uh, burners, then you don't want to spend a lot of money on this uh, operator interface, then you can buy P531, and it's just got a three lights, you know, showing you the status of each scanner, and buy one of these plug-in unit that plugs right into P531, and when you plug this one into it, it becomes like P532. So you can program it, and after the programming is over, you can remove this thing, go to the next, you know, lot or next unit, and uh, that way you save some money by not having this interface permanently on the unit itself. Uh, all of these units are predominantly used for, you know, high end of the industrial equipment, petrochemical, utility applications, uh, firing oil, gas, and pulverized coal. In fact, uh, when we go to the scanner, you'll see that using one of these with the uh, S500 series uh, viewing head, we can cover any fuel. You know, doesn't matter 
whether you are firing oil, gas, or coal, and in any proportions. So let me go to the next slide. This one is the lower end of the uh, both UV and IR. This can, this unit it can only support either a UV based scanners or IR, but not both. But it has got all the adjustment that we discussed before. You know that means flame on, flame off, uh, flame failure response time. Uh, gain control, filter, everything is built into it. Uh, this is the very most inexpensive uh, of the, all the units we make except for 800. But, uh, and this unit here uh, will support all the small industrial steam boiler. Anytime you have a single burner, this is a perfect uh, uh, play, use, uh, equipment except for the SRU. This is a very good equipment to use. And uh, furnaces, we have used this one as process burners, duct burners, natural draft burners, and where, you know, even on some multi-burners where the level of discrimination is not so severe. So if you have a two burners firing side by side or one over one, there's no reason why you can't use this as long as the distance between two is uh, more than like three and a half feet or four feet. This is a poor man's version of the same thing. It has no programming capability built onto it, so you have to buy a handheld unit that plugs into here and then use this 800. So we do use this one uh, in a places where once the adjustment is done, they don't want, need any more you know, uh, adjustments made. You know? So some customers still use this thing, mostly in uh, annealing furnaces and uh, uh, oh, batteries. Uh, so it's, it's you know it's reduced price, and I think that is the attractive part of it. So both of these units will support a UV based scanner or IR, but not a combination UV IR. So approvals, all iris safety products is approved by FM Global, and is fit for use in SIL three environment. So the SIL three approval is not a self certification it came from fm global and if anybody wants a copies of certificate or uh, of this uh, unit then uh, they are all on our website uh, and i'm sure bob can give you the location of the website so we have a, a 500 series that are csa uh, ce and fm approved for class 1 div 2 group a b c and d t5 and housing is also approved for NEMA 4X or IP64. And in the terms of the IEC, those who are interested in IEC, it is EXNA, ATEX uh, Category 3, Zone 2. So these are all the formal approval now that we have for all the 500 and P522, P525, 522, 531, 532. Okay. And the same thing goes for the 700. So what are these different viewing as we have? Uh, under the 550 series, the BE series, we have a UV tube only. Oh, sorry, UV tube and solid state IR. Now this will be what I would call a combination that will work on almost any fuel that you have and any level of difficulty in discrimination. The UV tube is the response is around 200 nanometers. IR is in 1400. Technology we use is a pulse count and a flicker for IR. And self-check, electronic only, there are no mechanical shutters. So three models of the viewing heads are available. 550BE is a UV and IR. 552BE is IR only. This will be mostly for oil, coal, and you know dirty gases, where you have a very fast movement of the flame. Uh, model 556BE is UV only for most gases. We just are going through the approval stage of a uh, new product called Uniscan 2. Uh, as you know, the market has been driving towards unitizing both processor and viewing head into one unit. So this is a, a, a U2 that uh, will uh, we have a approval for non-hazardous locations. We are expecting the uh, approval for hazardous locations within, I would say, four to six weeks now. It's been going on for a while. And this unit has got actually three sensors, the 
the UV tube, UV solid state, and IR. But you don't have to buy it that way. You can just get a UV tube. You can just get the IR or a combination UV yeah. tube and IR or all three sensors. And again, send it as a tag. And uh, the 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 operating part of it is so simple. Uh, we yeah. call it an iPod type because you punch or you, know, you, you tape the finger on a plus or minus or back and enter, and the menu comes up, and then you can increase one at a time digit by pressing one or you know or decrease by minus one, or you can put your finger on the uh, touch sensitive pad and you just move it around. Uh, just like an iPad, if you go clockwise, the number will increase. If you go the counterclockwise, the number will decrease. And this unit comes in uh, two ways. You can get a, one with a pigtail on it or a plug-in connector. I, this one only shows you the... So there's some more information on this thing that will be on the website. You might be interested to look at it. And again, it uses a very much... The, the sensors used are all identical as far as the UV and IR is concerned, but we have a new solid state UV sensor in there that operates around 310 nanometers. And the approval for this one is uh, that we are going to have is not only class 1 div 2 or EXNA, but it will be also class 1 div 1. And this will be of an interest to some refinery people because uh, some places they do require a class 1 div 1. So in ATEX, uh, uh, terms, it will be Zone 1 or EXD. And you'll notice one thing that we have done all this without having to take the basic unit and put it in explosion proof enclosure. So the, some other, let me just go back one slide, you know, Oops, two slides, okay. So everything, even this unit here is EXD or Class 1D1 approved, so you don't have to go and open it up to make the adjustment. Everything is right up there. And uh, that's one of the reasons we decided to go that way. OK, let's see now. Next next one. So Uniscan 2 is also still uh, used for, I mean, it is approved for use in a SIL-3 environment. And it's not adversely affected by X-rays or gamma rays. Uh, program is a sample glass, touch wheel sensor, easy access without removing housing, easy to understand menus. Uh, wish we had a more time and actual product to show you. Maybe next time I'll do the uh, audio part, I mean video part of it, you know. Uh, so far we talked about all the sensors and everything, uh, but there are places where just using the basic sensor or basic plant safety system will not be adequate. For example, in a tilting burners, we will be needing a fiber optic because as the bucket turns or the nozzle goes up and down, the line of sight is lost. So we make fiber optic systems. So that will be one of the places we'll need that. In some cases, I've seen where the ambient temperature is beyond the rating. Our, our, all our equipment is designed for minimum plus 70 degrees C or 158 Fahrenheit. But, you know, uh, and the 700 is uh, 85 degrees C or 185 Fahrenheit. But even that temperature may not be sufficient or rating may not be sufficient in some cases. In that case, we will put a fiber optic and move the viewing head away from the high heat area. Uh, the third reason we may want to use a fiber optic is the, the new Lonox coal burners have a very, very limited view, and it's got a lot of other devices inside the burner. I'm talking about the register burners. So we may want to get closer to the flame, and that's when you're going to use the fiber op optic with a skewed lens assembly. Uh, the skewed lens assembly allows us to rotate the rigid pipe and then uh, you know, con uh, move the tar uh, select the target area by just moving the uh, the lens assembly. Anyway, we'll talk about that later on if we have a time, but I wanted to show you some other product. So here is the fiber optic assembly, and you have a fiber optic right in the middle. That's your lens carrier, and that's your inner uh, carrier tubes, and this is where the scanner is connected, okay? 
and then we have an outer carrier. Now this carrier is fixed, to, this end here is fixed to the uh, nozzle end and then you have this part here that uh, comes out of the wind box front plate and uh, you know this unit is then inserted inside of it. Okay? And sometimes we supply the sleeve here so that uh, this unit can be mounted without damaging it, you know. So that's a fiber optic and there are two different type of fiber optics. Uh, the glass fiber optics is for oil and coal flames. Uh, the big advantage is that it's, it's inexpensive compared to the cords and uh, not as fragile as the uh, cords fibers. Transmission loss is reasonable. Uh, disadvantage, not suitable for gaseous flame. So if anybody tells you that they're going to use glass for flicker-based systems using uh, glass fiber, I'm telling you it will not work. I, I tried it before and uh, failed miserably. <laughs> now the coarse fiber optics are for gaseous flames, but they will also be able to see oil and coal, so you don't need both of them. But basically they use when you have a gas, and uh, suitable for gas, oil and coal, uh, transmitting less than glass fiber, which is a great thing, but the disadvantage is these are very expensive compared to the glass fiber and they are very fragile so you have to handle it with care and usually we we have a uh, once you lose about 30 percent to 40 percent of the fibers in there then that you lose a lot of signal so you have to replace them so you know handling with care is very important on that one this guy will be able to take abuse this will not so he, we have used also uh, fiber optic to monitor the gas turbines and I'm not talking about duct burners but actual gas turbines and the way we have done it is use the isolation swirl and then you have a isolator here which isolates this side of the unit from the gas turbine side. Uh, you put a air through here and it comes out all the way here and also here uh, and this end goes into a um, uh, what you call uh, processor. It could be 700 or 500. Uh, the advantage with this system compared to the uh, sensor that are mounted straight onto the gas turbine is that we have eliminated, first of all this is much smaller, so we have eliminated space need. We eliminated the vibration part of it because we have moved the viewing at far away from it and also the temperature. So we are looking forward to some more applications like that. It shows you the picture of uh, fiber optic, outer carrier, inner carrier, adopter here, and the viewing. Uh, this picture is a little bit old, but it gives you some ideas. So another equipment that we make are for flare monitoring, uh, and it consists of three parts. Signal process of mounting inside suitable cabinet, viewing head for mounting on the two inch pipe or a suitable mounting hardware and interconnecting cable. And from my first chart that I showed you before, we are using the same UV-tron tube in here as what we are using for the 500 and 700. And because of that, our system is totally immune to the sunlight. So you can point this unit towards the sun and if you have a stack that is uh, middle, I mean, in background is all sun, you don't have to worry about moving this unit so it doesn't see the sun. It will still be able to see the flame and ignore the sunlight. So that's your processor, which looks very much like P522. Uh, viewing head with a uh, display of the flame signals. And I should have mentioned that 500 series, the BE series, also has a similar display at the back of it. And uh, you have a telescopic hood. This one is mounted on a two inch pipe and then you can and you can mount it anywhere, you know, and this has been very, very successful product for Iris. So advantage is that it can be mounted anywhere around the flare stack, high gain, UV tron response in UV region beyond sun rays radiation. You can mount up to thousand feet away from the source two flame relays with adjustable delays, so you can set up one for 0 to 60 seconds, the other one from 1 to 3600 seconds. So this may be for the 
uh, this will be a pre uh, pre alarm and then this one will be to relight the pilot if this one goes out at the same time it's totally self checking system and this has got a built in rs422 communications for uh, communication with PC using a flame tool. Uh, let's talk about a little bit about the igniters. We make two different size of igniters. The GHE 1-3 is uh, good for 1 to 3 million BTU and GHE 2-5 is from 1 million to 10 and it can be even pushed to 15 million. One of the <coughs> secret of uh, success here is that we use a high energy uh, you know spark so this spark coming out here is around 12 to 14 joules it also includes a mixing chamber here where some of the gas uh, which is not premix comes out here and is ignited by the high energy igniters the remaining gas comes through here and is mixed with the air Okay, so the air is coming here and the remaining gas will be mixed here with that and it, this one has got a perforated shield which will keep the igniter uh, protected from any velocity, high wind, high velocity air passing through it. And also this area is perforated so you know everything is protected and in doing that we have a igniter that is highly stable. You can use this thing almost in a hurricane velocity air and it will still not blow off. So anyway, let me show you a couple of pictures of it. So here is your air coming in here and you have a mixing chamber here. So the grow gas comes out here and is ignited by this spark tip and the remaining gas comes out from these other tubes. Some of them are hidden behind it or underneath it. Uh, so that you got a really a three-stage ignition sparker lights up this zone that then in turn lights up the rest of the fuel. So it's a really a very, very stable uh, gas igniter. Okay, so here is the bottom part of it. You can see the raw gas comes in here. It's pre-mixed with air and then it comes out here whereas the other gas goes right through it here and it's lighted by the source here. Okay, we also make a flame tool, <coughs> which is a proprietary software designed to run on a window-based system. Currently, it only operates up to XP, but we are in a process of modifying it to work on Windows 7. Uh, you really don't need this one with our equipment because all the adjustments right on the on the faceplate. However, some people do prefer this, especially if you have a 30 or 40 burners and you don't want to go to the processor unit every time to check out, then you should use this and you can do the remote uh, display and remote programming. It's very inexpensive software also. So here is the, some of the displays that you will get on your PC uh, that will tell you the, it, it actually mimics the front of the panel and gives you exactly the same information what you see on the faceplate. Uh, here is the example of a uh, the P532 we were talking about. So there's a couple of gas nozzles here or gas distribution plates here. And you may have an oil here. Uh, the flame scanner is sitting there and your horn igniter is here. So P532 will be able to put one scanner for this unit, one scanner for this one, and one for that all in just one unit. Okay, so that's a, one of the advantage of uh, P532 that one sensor, one processor will support all three of them. Uh, we also support the installations and help customer in uh, setting it up. So here is the example of a uh, tangentially fired boiler where, you know, something like this would not be a right thing to do because it's got too much sag in it, and we will then look at the better way of doing it. You know. Location for the scanners are shown here. So we will do, we'll take the uh, drawings and we'll show you where to mount the scanners, the inclinations or the, you know, whether horizontal inclination and vertical inclination will be all included in the way uh, 
on the information that we will be providing. Uh, I'm just showing a boiler with uh, multiple nozzles here and just showing one level of burner firing. Uh, the, I put this slide because a lot of people ask me what is a T-fired or tilting burner or tangentially fired boilers and what does it look like. So here's an example of it. Uh, this is an oil fired unit and you can see the flames coming out and this nozzle here can be tilting down or tilting up, okay? 30 degree up or 30 degree down. So that is the, the presentations I have. Um, I'm ready to uh, you know, answer any questions you have and thank you again all of you for participating in this uh, seminar. Any question? Bob, any question? Any question? Uh, yes, anybody? Go ahead. Oh. Go ahead. I, yeah, Go ahead. I, just had, I just had a kind of a general question. Um, I'm a little bit more familiar with the uh, photo detector type uh, flame scanner that some other manufacturers have. Um, does Does Honeywell offer any any flame scanners using uh, photo detectors? Yeah, that's the one we talked about. Uh, you know, okay. Let me go back here. No, that's different. Really, than the no, there's okay. The sensors being used nowadays. Uh, some people will call it near UV, so they operate around 350 nanometers. Correct. And, and that's this guy in this area here. Uh, like I explained that. Uh, you know, operating closer to the UV zone because that's where most of the velocity of the flame is, uh, doesn't make much difference whether you operate in visible light or infrared as long as you can get the discrimination. It is advantageous to operate in this area. So the new flame scanner that we talked about a little bit, let me see if I can pull it up for you. Give me a second, okay. So this one here, uh, okay. So we this particular model, they call U2, has a, a solid state uh, uh, sensor also, which operates around 310 nanometers. Okay, and that would be considered a photo detector, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I wasn't too clear on that. Okay. Yeah, I think you will find that uh, people use the different terms now. Currently everybody wants to make uh, the sensor that operates in the UV region so but they can't say it's UV because uh, you know there is a uh, if you go by the historically what is accepted as the UV is anything below 300 nanometers so if you have a 310 350 they'll say near UV so different terms are used to describe the same thing but I think basically what you need to know uh, what you need to and, you know, uh, take in account is that the relative response, the UV tube gives us such a fantastic response uh, compared to the solid state sensor that we don't have to worry about signal to noise ratio here. Okay. Uh, the, the, the solid state sensors are great. If you have oil and coal, I would have no hesitation to use sensors that respond in a UV or near UV or a, a visible light or even an IR. We have used the IR sensors in this region on oil and coal so many places that with a great, great success. Now the only, the reason we kind of distinguish ourselves from other is that we still use the UV tube because more and more power plants that used to use the oil as a back uh, startup fluid or uh, fuel is now changing into the gas because of the environment requirement and this is where you know we have a problem with the uh, solid state sensor because the response is very low compared to the UV tube and therefore you can't take those signals and amplify it at a high level because your noise gets amplified too. Okay, thanks. Any other question? Yes, I was curious on the UV Tron. The, yes. uh, the one slide showing the checking, the electronic checking method, right. uh, that the statement is that the failed tube generates identical signals. 
And I was just wondering, is that uh, how was that validated? Is that uh, something that Iris performed a test of many, many tubes, or is this something coming from the manufacturer? This is uh, from the manufacturer. Okay. It, it, it would be very difficult for us to, well, first of all, it's very difficult to stimulate uh, a failed tube. Most of the time when the tube fails, they just stop conducting, you know, uh, they go bad. They, but there are times when the contamination inside the UV tube will fail them into producing the signal. And uh, this, by the way, this tube is made by Homamatsu, so mm -hmm. there's no secret, okay? Right. Uh, and they have uh, tested it and confirmed that, you know, that's how the tube will be when it fails in the conduction mode. Okay, thank you. Okay. And by the way, just to support uh, what I've been telling you, is that all this equipment has been tested and approved by FM Global. We, and we, it used to be just FM, but now it's FM Global because uh, we went there, we wanted to make sure that we get a universal approval that includes North American, FM, uh, CSA, and also IEC, ATEX, you know, for Europe and the rest of the world. You Any other like, question? Yeah, do you have like a sensor guarantee in terms of lifetime, and is that dependent on the application? Uh, you, are we talking about the UV tube now or the solid state? Well, all of them, I guess. I presume there's some sort of guarantee on the operation. Um, okay. Uh, usually, most manufacturers will guarantee their equipment for one year, you know, right? Uh, but in addition to that, if you feel that the sensor has prematurely failed, well, first of all, let's go back. The solid state sensors would normally not fail, you know. They are not subject to vibration. Uh, the only time they will fail is if you subject the unit to higher heat than rated ambient temperature. So if the ambient temperature is rated at 158 Fahrenheit and you are operating at uh, 170 or 180 degree Fahrenheit, then the sensors will get uh, damaged, you know, and there may be some other uh, equipment inside the viewing head that might get damaged because of the higher temperature. You know, how it's like everything else, higher temperature will do that. On a UV tube, we can run the UV tube at a very high temperature, up to 300 degree Fahrenheit, but what what is the problem with the UV tube and this is universal problem with any gas field device, that the seal eventually uh, will break, you know, because of uh, a, uh, the aging process. And sometimes the gas inside gets contaminated by continuous use. Now, by changing or varying the voltage on our tube, we can extend the life of the tube because we are not putting the same as a sine wave all the time, you know, we just reduce the voltage on it uh, to, as if we don't need that, that much gain, we'll reduce the voltage and increase the lifetime of the tube. Now, this is a very difficult question to answer, how long will it last? Well, you have to kind of qualify a few things. If there is not that much vibration, and I would say just a general vibration that you will experience on a, a boiler or a, you know, burners, and uh, you don't have a very uh, high temperature, and I mean high temperature beyond the rated value of the viewing head, then I have seen the tube last 20 years, 22 years, uh, but most of them uh, will last at least 12 to 15 years. Now, in case of some literature in Honeywell tube, they will say that, you know, at certain time you should replace it. Uh, the reason is that most of the Honeywell equipment, uh, before the IVs came in, is uh, non-adjustable gain. So they are fixed gain scanner. And when you have a fixed gain and you lose, lose a little bit of uh, sensitivity in the tube, you know, it just goes downstream after that. You know, it keeps on decreasing. We can compensate for that if necessary, which I've never used it before, but you can by just simply increasing a gain a little bit to compensate for aging of the tube. So the tubes will last for a very long time. The other thing that you may, may, it may not be very apparent is the tube itself is so small, it's about uh, three-quarter of an inch long by about 
I would say, three eighths of an inch diameter. So it's not a very big tube like those that are used in fire eye and honeywell equipment. Okay. Any other questions on? Uh, I just had a uh, question uh, regarding your uh, spark your spark systems. Uh, uh -huh. now, it's only it only fits with your igniter. It can't be used with any other manufacturer's igniter. Uh, <coughs> you're talking about the high energy part of it, right? Well, I I mean the spark rod. The spark the, rod, okay. Uh, that's specific for your igniter. Now, the, the uh, HEI could probably be used with others, correct? Electronics. Yeah, the power pack can be used with. Uh, it's just a standard power pack with that delivers 12 joules of energy. Uh, the 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 tip actually at this point here. Uh, can you see the picture? All right, right. You can see the display, right? Yes. Oh, okay. So this tip here is a plug-in tip, so you can unscrew it and replace it. And uh, it's not uh, this. This is something that we buy it from a manufacturer anyway. So you should be able to buy it if you need to replace it. But the rest of the equipment here is kind of customized to fit into our equipment. Your igniter, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we currently we don't make uh, all these igniters are fixed, but there is a. Uh, some need, I haven't seen that much. Uh, on oil, you definitely will need to insert and retract the, the oil gun. But in the gas, most people just leave the gas unit, you know, in fixed mode. So we can do the same thing here. But uh, mm -hmm. there are some people who are asking us for retractable gas igniters. So, you know, maybe in the future we'll have to look into that. <laughs> okay. And just, just one other question regarding uh, flame rods. Does Honeywell make a flame rod now? I missed part of the webinar. but uh, uh, well, we we do have a flame rod. Honeywell does make a flame rod, but currently, uh, actually, let me see. Oh, I don't have a very big flame rod there. I think I lost the picture somewhere. Uh, we do. We are in a process of uh, making. I think I lost my picture of flame rod. Uh, we are in process of redesigning the the flame rod processor. You know, the flame rod itself is uh, not a very uh, intelligent thing, right? But we are right. in the process of designing the new, or actually we have a uh, a prototype already made of a flame rod processor that will be using 11-pin uh, socket, the standard 11-pin socket, and you just plug it into it. But what we have done is made it a little bit more use of, well, more information available. So you can select on that flame rod uh, flame failure response time of one, two, or three seconds. It's got a couple of LEDs, and the input is a universal. Either you can put from 85 to 265 volt AC or 24 volt DC or both. So uh, we should have that in the marketplace. I'm hoping by middle of next year. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Anything else uh, I can help with? Any other questions? Anybody? Well, okay. I, uh, any, th any thank more? you, everybody. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Lily, thanks, thanks for your presentation. Uh, if you have any specific application questions, uh, feel free to call us at uh, at 8900-LESMAN or 800-953-7626. If you don't know your account manager, feel free to ask for inside sales. They'll make sure you get taken care of. Later today, you'll get an invitation to join our LinkedIn forum. The forum is a way of keeping up to date on our upcoming seminars or webinars, as well as a place to host, post your questions and connect with others that have attended seminars. When we schedule a new session, LinkedIn is the first place we'll post it. Give it a try. At uh, this point, there are no further questions. Uh, our presentation is concluded, and uh, thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob.